evening. Welcome to you tonight. Good to have you here. Uh, we will begin by taking a look at a couple of announcements. Uh, so Friday night, the first is uh, teen, uh, the annual Teen Hayrack Ride, uh, 6 to 9 p.m. I'm assuming everybody uh, that needs to knows about that. Uh, men's prayer meeting is Saturday morning at 7.30. And then Saturday is the open house baby shower for Omar and Tracy from between noon and 2. Um, and again, if, if you know what your plans are one way or the other, if you would please let Kelly know as quickly as possible. Uh, and then Sunday, of course, we are resuming our donuts in the Sunday school hour. And then we're going to have our first uh, potluck fellowship after the evening service uh, this coming Sunday night. So just a note about that. Let me see a couple of other things here. If there's anything else that we have uh, that's done and done. Okay, um, and then if you looked in your mailbox tonight, you noticed that there is a pen there. We bought some new, some nice new church pens to give to our guests. We have them in the pews, um, in the pew racks. We would ask that you not take them from the pew rack. Uh, there's one in your mailbox. And the, but if, if you know somebody that's not Westwood Heights and you want to use it promotionally, then we can get them to you. But so anyway, that's, that's that. So. Let's stand and we're going to pray and then we'll have our opening song together tonight. Lord, always thank you for your mercy to us and upon those mercies may we be consecrated servants in every imaginable way. We ask you to help us to be like Jesus Christ. We ask you to help us to live in the power of your spirit in obedience to the scriptures. We ask that you would teach us those scriptures. We pray for your help and Lord, we are greatly aware as we study a book like Revelation that we need supernatural instruction. And so we pray your blessing upon our service tonight to that end. In Jesus name, amen. I trust you're in good voice. I'm not tonight, so uh, you're gonna have to really sing out. <clears throat> On the chorus of this uh, song we're going to sing, it says, think about this, Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought. Amen on that one. For 349, complete in need, 349. <clears throat> place of thine, thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified, salvation wrought, thy blood hath pardoned but for me, and glorified I soon shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin, the grace hath conquered, reigns within. The boy shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified and sanctified, ovation wrought. Thy blood hath but for me, thy blood hath brought to me. Complete in thee, each one supplied, and no good thing to be denied. Since thou my portion, Lord, wilt be, I ask no more. Complete in thee, sing it out now. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified, salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, pardoned, I tune. That last phrase, and glorified I too shall be, right? On that last stanza, lift it up together, 349. Dear Savior, when before the bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be at thy right hand, complete in me. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified, Salvation. Oh, 
loved and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Thank you. You may be seated. So I have them once in a while pick things out for me, and once in a while they pick one that, oh, I don't know if I know that one. Yeah, okay, well, we'll struggle through it. We'll go through it. So then after she played it, I thought, I've heard that. Yes, many times before, but I haven't sung it forever. It's the Patch the Pirate song, whatever. So you're going to sing it with me, and you're going to sing out because I, I've heard it, I've sung it, but it's been many times too little. 165, How Can I Fear? 165. <clears throat> Shadows fall, my covers fall. There are things that our eyes cannot see. I'll never fear, for the Savior is near. My Lord abides with me. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches o'er or me. Worries all cease. He gives me peace. How can I fear with Jesus? When I'm, I'm alone and I face the unknown and fear what the future may be. How can depend on the strength of my friend? He walks along with me. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me On the last stanza, Jesus is king, he controls everything, he is with me each night and each day. I trust my soul to the Savior's control, he drives all fear away. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me peace. How can I fear with Jesus? Good singing. Thank you. Revelation chapter 8, please. Revelation 8. I wonder how many of us who two years ago would have had colds and seasonal, seasonal allergies this time of year now have COVID. <clears throat> Former President George Bush once said that he was a Christian but not the born-again type. <clears throat> I have COVID but not the contagious type, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Revelation 8 is our text this evening. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll just kind of work our way into the passage. Well, Lord, no surprise to you, there are dozens of ways of looking at this, your last book. And, of course, we have our way of looking at it, and we pray that our way is the correct way. I pray always to be gracious to those whose views are different as long as <clears throat> they are not heretical. 
But we do pray that you would help us tonight to think rightly about the conclusion to the age in which we are living and that it would echo out to your glory across the globe. And help us then to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with what to us is chapter 8, which was not anything that John would have recognized, just continuously writing what he had seen and heard. We resume to the seal judgments. <clears throat> At the end of the sixth seal, in chapter 6, the world is recognizing that what is going on on planet Earth is not simply natural in nature, that it's not the product of national rivalries or political tensions or economic woes, but is in fact the very wrath of God being poured out upon mankind. And the last question of the sixth seal is, the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Which is answered in what to us is chapter 7. Uh, those that are able to stand are those whom God has sealed and those whom God has saved, which I would treat as euphemisms for the same kind of thing. They're described differently, but that is what we have in chapter 7. And it's then in what to us is chapter 8, uh, John's vision returns to the judgments. Uh, chapter 7, of course, is critically important, and we'll make reference to it much over the next chapters ahead. Um, I think, I can't remember now which of the minor prophets' prayer was, whether it's Haggai or Habakkuk, in wrath remember mercy, in wrath remember mercy. And God is being merciful to a sinful world even at this juncture, and many millions are being saved. <clears throat> but as we will see in a few weeks in, in Revelation 9, there is still a sizable number of people who are adamantly refusing to repent. So, uh, there are five distinct events, I think, in Revelation chapter 8, and so we'll just kind of walk through the chapter in that fashion. We'll, <coughs> excuse me, we will see what John sees. Uh, the first one is simply verse number one, and that's the opening of the seventh seal. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. When he'd opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. The he, of course, is Jesus Christ. And we will again come refer to this time and time again. The, the book of the judgments is in his hand, and he is on opening those judgments. And this is all then the ret retribution of God upon the planet Earth. And upon this opening, there is... Stunned silence in heaven for 30 minutes. This is completely and radically different from what we have seen at the other seal openings. There's been some flurry of activity, some judgment pronounced. But what we have is silence. This is no doubt an exaggeration, but it is a pretty accurate ratio. There are probably 10,000 commentaries on the book of Revelation. In my humble opinion, probably 10 of them are worth reading. The vast majority of commentaries on the book of Revelation are not worth the time and effort. Interestingly enough, one of the ones that is worth reading was written by a man from a denomination that might surprise us, and that is he is a Lutheran, or he was a Lutheran. He's Long with the Lord. <clears throat> His name was Joseph Seiss, <clears throat> and there's a series of lectures that were put into publication called The Apocalypse, Lectures on the Book of Revelation. Now, it's worth reading. I don't agree with everything. But I want to take a moment and just read what Joseph Seiss says about Revelation 8.1. The silence, nevertheless, has made a good deal of noise in the world, especially among the commentators. 
It would be difficult to find another point upon which there have been so many different and discordant voices. Indeed, Hengstenberg gives it as a general rule that when expositors come to this silence, they break out into all sorts of contradictory conjecture, though the marks of historic continuity are as distinct as it is possible to make them. Some take this silence as a full stop to the chain of apocalyptic predictions, and so treat what follows as a mere rehearsal, in another form of what had preceded. Others regard it as a blank, leaving everything belonging to the seventh seal unrevealed, so that its actions can only be known when we come to the immortal life. Some pronounce it a mere poetic invention to heighten the dramatic effect, but having no particular significance. Others treat it as a prophetic symbol of scenes and experiences of the earthly history of man. Some as the freedom granted to the church under the reign of Constantine. Some as the interval of repose enjoyed by Christians between the persecutions of Diocletian and Galerius in AD 311 and the beginnings of the civil wars toward the end of the same year. Some as the disappearance of human strivings against God and his Christ. Others as a lull in earthly revolt and persecution, equivalent to a jubilee for the truth among men. Others as the millennium of peace and righteousness to be induced by the trumpet triumphs of evangelistic effort and the progress of liberty. And yet others as the everlasting rest of the saints. And yet there is not a word in the record about the church nor about earth. The whole thing is distinctly located in heaven and its duration is specifically limited to about a half hour. This is one of the reasons, folks, that the vast majority of commentaries on the book of Revelation are not reading, not worth reading, because they are undertaking all of these fanciful imaginations that Seiss has identified. But the text, if you'll look at it, and you can, and we take it at face value, and I do, There was not silence on earth, there was silence in heaven, and it lasted for about 30 minutes. And there's nothing wiggling there. John is not being dogmatic. He didn't say, and at that moment, the the stopwatch timed, and it ran exactly 30 30 minutes, but it was about a half an hour. That's what he said. That is what he meant. We do not know what happened or why this happened. Did they see something that we don't say when they saw what was contained, did they just hold their breath collectively? We don't know. We are not told. What we are told is that there is 30 minutes of silence. And with that, we move into the second scene of Revelation chapter 8. John sees seven angels, verse number 2. And another, I'm sorry, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God And to them were given seven trumpets. John says they're the angels who stand before God. We have not yet met them in the book of Revelation. There were not seven angels described anywhere in Revelation 4 and 5. But to each of these seven angels was given a trumpet. And we already know or we've at least heard somewhere that the seals give rise to trumpet judgments, and that is what is about to follow. That brings us to the third scene, and that is in which John sees yet another angel. So the seventh seal is opened, and there is silence. Seven angels are given trumpets, and then there is another angel, verses 3, 4, and 5. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So, We have then, in addition to the seven angels, we have this eighth angel. And he comes and stands at the altar. We talked a little bit about this last, or a couple of weeks ago. The the temple, or the tabernacle, depending upon where the Jews were in their history, 
had two altars. It had a large altar where the sac outside of the court, in the courtyard where the animals were slain or offered, burnt after they were slain. And then there was the small altar of incense inside the holy place. If this altar is one of those, if it is representative of the heavenly tabernacle, it is almost certainly the altar of incense. And we see the word incense used here. This angel has what our King James Bible calls a censer, which is literally some kind of container or device, a flat pan for holding hot coals. That's what it is. And there is fire on the altar, and he is given then a large amount of incense. And he is to take that incense, and he is to mingle the incense with the prayers of all the saints, and he is to put it upon the golden altar. Now, here's yet again, and we've, I mentioned it only because we've talked about it a number of times in Romans 11 uh, the last few weeks. Here is once again that word, all. Came up with the prayers of the, all the saints is the idea there, with every saint. So we, there's a, just a little bit of academic discussion whether this is all the saints of all the ages, and it probably is all of the prayers of God's people for God's vindication over the course of all time. This was a concept known even in the Old Testament, Psalm 141 and verse number 2. David said, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So even in the Old Testament, people identified their prayers with this sweet aroma that went up to God. And, and God talks about that. That, that, he, that when these offerings are made to him, that the smell of those offerings is appeasing to him in some way. And that would be true then also of the prayers of the saints. In Luke 1.9, we read about Zacharias, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So we have the prayers of God's people. If it doesn't include all of our prayers, it most certainly includes the prayers of those who are under the altar in Revelation 6, 8. The question that they asked in Revelation 6, 8 was when? When will you avenge our blood? And it appears, folks, that in the sounding of the seven trumpets, we have the beginnings of the answer to that question. When are you going to avenge our blood? And it's almost as if God says, the time starts now. <clears throat> so two things, folks, you notice there, right, in verse number four, that when the angel brought the incense or offered the incense and offered the prayers, that this is immediately done in the presence of God. The smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So in one sense, we are oriented with these prayers and this incense upward to the Lord himself. But in verse number five, the same angel takes from the same altar that same fire and throws it down to the earth. So that there is a clear connection, right? That altar then becomes kind of the bridge between earthly activities and heavenly activities. And when that happens, all of heaven breaks out into sounds, voices, the noise of people, living beings, and there is lightning and thundering and an earthquake. So we, we begin with this 30 minutes of absolute silence that is followed very quickly by an unbelievable amount of noise from a variety of sources. And all of that then prepares us <clears throat> for what happens fourthly in verses 6 through 12, and that is that the first four of the seven trumpets sound. We've seen in verse number 2 that there are seven angels with seven trumpets. Now we will read about four of those angels. <clears throat> In verse number six, we read, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets 
prepared themselves to sound. You can see them getting their trumpet ready, getting it up to their mouth, getting their lips ready to, to blow into the mouthpiece. This trumpet judgment activity will continue in some measure all the way through chapter 11 and verse number 19. So there are a variety of chapters, 8, 9, 10, and much of 11, that are dealing with these trumpets and their varying judgments. So obviously we're not going to try and cover all of that material this evening. In verse number 7, the first trumpet sounds. <clears throat> the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and the green grass was burnt up. <clears throat> so we have the first trumpet sounding, and we have hail, fire, and blood <clears throat> thrown down upon the earth. In Job 38.22, when Job gets his prayer answered and he has an audience with God only to find himself way over his head, one of the questions God asked him was whether or not he had seen the treasures of hail. And that word treasure can describe like a warehouse, almost as if God is somehow stockpiling hail. I think this is all imagery for our minds. Almost as if God is building an arsenal of hail that he is preparing to use. Now, this is a little bit down the road, folks. We'll get to this in a couple of weeks. But it's critically important to everything that goes on in the book of Revelation. Every activity and every moment is carefully orchestrated and choreographed. It is no doubt on earth are going to appear like complete and total pandemonium. But from heaven's perspective, every event is carefully planned right down to the very hour. And so God unleashes hail, fire, and blood, it is thrown upon the earth, and John sees that it destroys one-third of the trees and all of the green grass. So <clears throat> we can put it this way, right? I mean, if you write in your Bible or are taking notes or making notes, right? the first trumpet destroys land because that's what it does. It destroys land, trees and grass, trees and grass and nothing else. So again, it's not random fire just burning up whatever it hits. It hits trees, it hits grass, and they are consumed. In verses 8 and 9, the second trumpet sounds. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. John said, I saw something that looked like a great burning mountain. <clears throat> Is this a meteor? I don't, we don't know. I was getting ready to say I had to go back to my elementary science classes, but actually I had to go to Google to remember the difference between a, mount, between a meteor and an asteroid. When it's in heaven, it's an asteroid. When it enters Earth's atmosphere, it's a meteor. But basically, it's a rock on fire. And this, whatever it is, this great burning mountain crashes right into the ocean and turns one-third of the sea to blood and kills one-third of all ocean life and kills one-third of the boats or destroys one-third of the boats. And so now with this trumpet, right, God has brought judgment upon land, and now he brings judgment upon oceans. And then in verses 10 and 11, the third trumpet sounds. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, 
burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. <clears throat> Again, back to Google for remedial science. An asteroid turns into a meteor when the burning bunch of rock enters Earth's atmosphere. But a star is technically not burning rock. It is plasma, which is a form of matter held together by its own gravity. It is something technically different. This star has a name. It's called Wormwood. Wormwood is a real substance. It is actually an herb called absinthe, A-B-S-I-N-T-H-E. And it is actually a bitter herb. And if it's taken in small doses, it can have tremendous benefit to the human body. But it is poisonous if taken in large quantities. Well, there's going to be a large quantity of it here. And this star falls into the fresh water sources and pollutes them. So here's where we are, folks, right? I mean, if we just try to follow the trajectory of what's going on, right? It is almost as if, and this is not the only agenda, but people have been clamoring for God to avenge his name and to avenge his, the persecution of his people. And now their prayers are offered upon the altar of incense and that prayer and the fire is thrown to earth. And God begins to destroy the earth itself. And he does it systematically. First the land. Then the oceans. Now the fresh water. And there's only one thing left with reference to earth. And that is verse number 12. <clears throat> the fourth angel. The fourth trumpet. A systematic destruction of the planet. Restrained only, by the way, I would suggest, only because of his mercy, that only a third is destroyed and two-thirds survive. Verse number 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. So with this fourth trumpet, the very heavenly bodies are struck by God's judgment. And their light is somehow reduced by a third. And when John says that the night likewise, what he means is that the darkness itself is even affected by this. In the book of Exodus, when God began to visit the judgments upon Egypt, the Bible tells us that the darkness was so thick it could be felt. Almost as if you weren't just walking in the absence of light, but in the presence of some substance that you had to push your way through. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things Seitz additionally points out, and he's not the only one, but is that many people see this as some kind of spiritual or symbolic of some spiritual darkness. But again, folks, I would come to the text and ask, why would we read it that way? We wouldn't read the book of Exodus that way. When God smote the land with darkness, no Bible believer goes to the book of Exodus and goes, but it wasn't real darkness, it was symbolic of Egypt's great spiritual darkness. Which goes dark. Couldn't see. And I think that is exactly <clears throat> what's going on here. Now, we really can't. I've made a couple of comments already about COVID. But, but, but let's take what we've experienced in the last year and a half to help us get a little bit of perspective on what is coming. Four trumpets in. 
And we have the entire universe decimated by 33%. A third of the ground, a third of the fresh water, a third of the salt water, and a third of the heavenly bodies. We have 25% of the earth's population already dead. About one and three quarters billion people if it happened today. A recent study estimated that at the end of 2020, right, and we're 10 months in now almost to 2020, that at the end of 2020, about one-third of all Americans have had COVID. About 100 million Americans have had COVID. The death rate from COVID Everything ascribed to COVID, whether you died from COVID or with COVID, 0.065%. 0.065%. We haven't even reached 1%. We haven't even reached a 1% death rate. And our, and, and our children are being compelled to wear masks. And many states are still having mask mandates. And the pressure to vaccinate and to get the booster is only ramping up. And that is something that has affected one-third of us in which slightly over one-half of one percent of us who get it died. Folks, the panic that is going to spread over planet Earth when these events are happening cannot be calculated. And there's just no way to quantify that kind of fear. And by the way, well, we'll get to it in a moment. We're just, we're just scratching the surface of the terror that is to come. We're just scratching the surface of the terror that is to come, which brings me then to the fifth scene. <clears throat> the seal is open, an angel, <clears throat> another angel, the four seal, the four trumpets. Verse number 13, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And we will soon learn that that woe, woe, woe is not just grammatical rep repetition for emphasis, but that there are actually three woes that come with the last three trumpets. Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth. So if we just, right, if we just kind of think of the, the panic and the fear that has characterized so much of our country in the last year and a half, of something that really statistically is very small. I'm not saying it's not serious to those that get it, but statistically, it is very small. And then we think about how humongous human suffering is going to be in the tribulation. Just a couple of things at the very end to tie it all together. One of the things we want always to remember, and this will become particularly important, I think, when we get to the end of chapter 9, is that God himself argues that all human beings have some innate knowledge of him. That all human beings are accountable for recognizing that the world they inhabit was created. When the sixth seal breaks, they will no longer be suppressing that truth. Right? This, is, this is what Paul argues in Romans 1, that men are, our King James Bible says, holding the truth in unrighteousness. The idea is they are sitting on truth in unrighteousness. They're, they're, they're squashing the truth. We don't want the truth to get out. And they're doing this on unrighteousness. But when we get to the sixth seal, folks, that will no longer be the case. That will no longer be the case. They will now know 
that it is Jehovah God who is bringing their judgments. And yet we also want to remember that God has said, and in Joel chapter 3, He said it specifically in the context of Revelation, that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now Joel 3 is quoted by Paul in Romans 10, and it is quoted by, by Peter at Pentecost. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My COVID's kicking up. But, but when the prophecy was made in Joel's day, right, the specific framework for it was this event, that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So God will still be extending his arm of mercy and men will still be coming to him in faith throughout this horrific event. It probably will, folks, be the greatest harvest of souls in the history of mankind. John has already told us about them, but there is coming a group of people who dig their heels in and absolutely will not repent. We will get to them. All right, let's I'm going to stop there tonight. If you want to take your belt, your prayer bulletin, let me give you an update under health concern. Uh, Linda Gentry's brother-in-law, Bob, we have been praying for Bob now for probably two or three years with his ongoing battle with cancer, but, but the, the, the health care professionals are now saying, it's, it's at most a matter of a couple of weeks, and, and he is gonna, he's going to succumb to the cancer. Saved man, been for many years a pastor, but so just pray for the family. Um, they put him in hospice. The, you know, there's, unless the Lord just does a miracle, there's, there's nothing going on there. Continue, of course, please to pray for Michelle Hutton. <clears throat> Roman, do you have any kind of an update for us on what's going on with your mom? Okay, so she had the surgery, went successful. They were thinking about rehab, so just continue to pray for the family there. Um, Dan Mortensen, they put another cast on his wrist, and so he's uh, continuing to recuperate there, we hope. Anything else that you need to add to, to the prayer list? Yes, ma'am? you got to really wave that arm, Janelle. I can't see that far back. She's very sick physically, and I know she's very discouraged <clears throat> by all of this. And we talked a couple of weeks ago, and Kurt and I talked last week, so please do continue to pray for Michelle Spaulding. Under normal circumstances, being able to eat and still lose weight would be something we would all welcome. But <clears throat> for Michelle, it's an indicator that things are really, really not well with her. So, yes, do continue to pray for her. Anything else you want to add or update? Abby. And, and that was the gal who, did she lose her husband? No, Okay. April, I saw I saw your post on Facebook, but so anyway, pray for the family of April, young young lady. COVID is that what it is? Complications from COVID. So, is there anything else? Yes, ma'am. All right, the young lady that's, that was coming, 
Brianna with the Hughes and then grandma wouldn't let her come anymore because for whatever reason and now grandma's going to kick her out is that the idea what's she going to do does she have any idea okay all right so so just pray pray for that whole situation did I do the whole service tonight with my microphone under my chin I, did, did, you, did you pick me up or were you just using this? Okay. I mean, seriously, because if I do, and I can't always tell, you guys got to wave or throw a rock at me or something like that. <clears throat> Chad? Oh, did you fall down? Okay, it work? I'm sorry. Okay, pray for Chad. All right, let's go together to the Lord then. Well, Father, we pray for your help. There are, just in our small assembly, Lord, there are lots of heavy hearts this evening. There are terminal diseases and illnesses that seem to have no human answer. And we just pray, Lord, that you would provide grace for those folks, and we pray that that you would provide whatever healing you're willing to provide in the time that you're willing to provide it. Lord, we know that ability is not in any way the, the issue. And so we ask for consolation and encouragement and comfort. We pray, Lord, that we, your people, would would be exhorters and encouragers of people in their suffering, that that would be a ministry that we would have to them. Uh, We do pray for your will about Brianna, and especially that she would come to know you. We pray for healing for Michelle Hutton. We pray, Lord, that people would come to you in faith and believe on your name, that we would be good and faithful witnesses. And Father, we pray for the end. We pray that in spite of the devastation and the destruction and the panic, we pray that you would come and establish your kingdom. That even so, you would come, Lord Jesus, and May that be our cry, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Good night.